welcome everybody to our program and so today our guest is Alexander Motil, uh, is an American historian, uh, political scientist, poet, writer, translator and artist painter. Actually, I didn't know that you were even an artist painter. That's true? Yes, that's true. I'm having a show of my works at Columbia right now. Hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to talk about uh, the painting and all of these uh, cultural aspects, but after the victory of Ukraine. <laughs> so now it's better use your knowledge as like a historian. And it's interesting for me to hear your opinion because uh, from what I hear, your quotes for our colleagues journalists, let me quote you. Russia can fall apart, which can lead to a civil war or even a war between different parts of Russia. And I I personally believe that this is not only possible, but also very possible. What is uh, your so sharp confirm based on? Because if almost all uh, Russian activists from uh, various fields of activity with whom we spoke on our TV channel, they personally believe that this is not any possible visual activity that uh, can bring this idea that you are saying about collapsing Russia. It depends on whom you talk to, because there are Russian analysts such as Andrei Piontkovsky. Uh, just recently I was listening to Valery Sol Solovey, not Solovyov, um, and they actually do believe that the uh, collapse of Russia is possible. Um, so it depends. Uh, I would also, before I answer your question, I would also like to emphasize that I'm not the only one who believes this. Um, a Polish-American author, a Polish author by the name of Janusz Wugajski published a book a few months ago called Failed State, and he predicts that Russia will indeed fall apart. And then just recently, last week, the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., published the results of a survey they did of 161 experts in Europe and the United States from government, business, academe, and journalism. And of that number, 47% believe that Russia would collapse within the next 10 years. And 20% believe that Russia had the potential to be a failed state. And only 10% believe that Afghanistan would be a failed state. So my point in mentioning this is simply to say this is a fairly widespread belief. Uh, one year ago, I think very few people would have subscribed to this belief. But now as a result of the war, uh, it's becoming not just respectable, but as you can see, quite widespread. As to why I think this is uh, uh, the case, to put it very simply, uh, we know from history, we know from political science, that when weak, brittle uh, regimes, states, confront major crises, especially wars, these wars enervate them, these wars weaken them, they sharpen contradictions within the regime, within the state, within the society, and very often they result in not just a collapse of the regime, but in a collapse of the state. Many examples, I mean, the most prominent examples would be those of World War I, when in the aftermath of the war, Austria-Hungary, the German Reich, Imperial Russia, and the Ottoman Empire all collapse. And where some of them, now they're in the Russian case, the Russian Empire was revived in a few years in the form of the Soviet Union. But these sorts of crises, in other words, they do happen. And when they affect weak states, these states have a tendency to collapse. Uh, it's not a guarantee. One can go back to the Roman Empire. By the time that the Roman, the Western Roman Empire collapsed, in 475 AD, of uh, the trigger, the spark, or le as Lenin said, the iskra, right? The spark that led to this conflagration, that led to the collapse, was the massive influx of, quote, barbarians cross crossing the boundaries of the Roman Empire. 
and the empire was simply incapable of dealing with this crisis. So crises, the triggers, the sparks, they can be anything. They can be, they usually are wars, but they could be invasions such as those of the barbarians. They can be misguided but well-intentioned reform efforts, such as those introduced by Mikhail Gorbachev in the name of Glasnost and Perestroika. The Soviet Union was a weak totalitarian state, and his reforms, however, although very welcome because they were democratizing reforms, had the effect of weakening the Communist Party. Eventually, as you recall, the Communist Party was declared that it was no longer the yadro, the core of the political system. So the regime was weakened. And once the regime was weakened, the state eventually fell apart. And in that sense, Gorbachev acted in the role, this bringer of crisis to the system. So the important things to keep in mind is, is the system, the political, social and economic system strong or weak? And is there an outside crisis trigger spark that will then lead to the weakening and possibly the collapse of the regime and then possibly of the state as well? And in the case of the Russian Federation, we know that the regime and Putin himself are significantly weaker today than they were a year ago. We also see that there are a variety of decentralizing tendencies uh, within the Russian Federation. And then last but not least, there is the humiliation of the war, which Russia is losing. It's already lost 112,000 soldiers. It's not doing well on the battlefield. And you add up all of these factors and the prospects for Putin's regime are very grim and if and when the regime collapses and it will happen sooner or later then the consequences for the federation will be destructive as well but still let's uh, take a look uh, at the human factor and let's take a look uh, at the historical context uh, because um, what i've heard uh, today in the morning from Edward Radzinski, you know this historian, and he uh, gave a lecture a long, long time ago, maybe even 15 or 20 years ago, b before even Putin, and he was talking about what's going on uh, in the free countries or free states and uh, in the states of slaves. That's how he called Russia during all this historical period. So if people in a free state are not satisfied uh, with what's going on in their life, they oppose to the government and just change the rules of game. But in the uh, states of uh, slaves, they just do what slaves do. They just escape from the country. That's we observe right now in Russian Federation, massive escape from the country, from people who can slightly decide something in this country. The other population that uh, remains in the country, they are mostly from another psychological type uh, that uh, Edward Radzinski um, explains in his lecture. These are people who during all this period of Russian Empire, uh, post-Russian Empire, Soviet state, and nowadays, they are mostly gathered together in the hardest time of uh, the historical period to find the reasons why they're so weak, why they're so poor, and why they're so forget by all of the world from outside. So the people have to want the changes. Or you think that in this uh, example, it doesn't matter. It will fail, it will break, it will uh, uh, fall apart, uh, no matter what people this or not. Again, I, w I would say that that's an illusion to, to, to think that people must want a transformation, a revolution. Uh, obviously, if they do, that can help. But again, we know historically, we know from the example of Russia, other countries, most revolutions, most major transformations begin with protests against minor things, lack of bread, high prices. And remember what happened in Kazakhstan in January of last year, they raised the price on fuel. And then that uprising, in effect, led to a regime change. 
Tokayev replaces Nazarbayev and, well, again, not, not a complete regime change, but at least a partial change. So I think historically, and again, in terms of comparative political studies, it's just not true that people must want to transform a society for that society to change. If they do want it, it promotes change, but it's not necessary. What's necessary is that there be a conflict within the elite, that there be a strong and presumably a strong conflict within the elite, and that, of course, already exists in Russia. It's also necessary that the system itself the system, uh, the political system itself, have be weak and full of contradictions. In other words, the economy has to be weak as opposed to strong. And we know uh, the Russian economy was tiny compared to that of China or the United States even before the war. And now it's becoming even smaller. There have to be social contradictions, whether class contradictions or ethnic contradictions, religious, social, uh, regional, any number of such contradictions. The military and the forces of coercion have to be weak and inefficient as well. And that we can see uh, openly today. So I would say, as I, uh, you know, in response to your question, yes, it matters a bit if the people want change, but the change itself, the major transformation, usually takes place independently of the people and their desires. Then I would, however, emphasize the following. Revolutions, system breakdowns, these sorts of big transformative events, if they happen, they happen as a result of popular desire or popular activity. It's not because of what people in Omsk or Tomsk want or in Kansas or in Missouri. It's because of what happens in the capital city and in the largest cities. So if there were to be a revolution in the United States, it would matter what New York and Washington wanted and Chicago and Los Angeles. It doesn't matter what St. Louis wants. And the same is true of Russia. Moscow and Petersburg are the key. And we know, at least from journalist accounts, and we also know from some surveys, that popular attitudes within those two cities are least favorable toward Putin and his regime and most inclined to engage in various forms of protest. One more point. I understand the point about the Russian mentality, uh, but there's usually a second part to this. Namely, and again, this is a this is a debate that goes back hundreds of years, but the on the one hand, Russians, yes, indeed, do have this kind of love of authority a slave-like love of authority. But again, historically, we know that every 10, 20, 30 years, major peasant uprisings, strikes, pogroms, all sorts of events like that have occurred in Russian history. Just in the 20th century, let's not forget that in 1916, 17, the soldiers were leaving the front, peasants were rebelling, seizing property. In 1929, 1930, there were rebellions against collectivization, mostly in Ukraine, but also in Russia. In the 1980s, millions came out in support of Perestroika and Glasnost, and then thousands came out in support of Yeltsin in 1990, 1991. There were demonstrations, mass demonstrations in Moscow and Petersburg in 2011 after the falsified elections, Khabarovsk, and of course, last but not least, the Belarusian uprising. Uh, we always assumed here in the West, in any case, that the Belarusians were quiet and were like Russians. Mm -hmm. And then the Belarusians show that they're not. So it all depends. I wouldn't write off the Russians immediately for a variety of reasons. But even if I did, I would say that it doesn't matter because the regime will collapse because of its own characteristics. You've just said very important and interesting thing that uh, we don't have to wait uh, the start of uprising uh, from North Caucasus, uh, from Khabarks or elsewhere. Ig uh, by the way, this example of Khabarks, I wanted to remind because I uh, found out that uh, 
been almost two years already that they're aimlessly uh, making all these round dances uh, to which the authorities don't even uh, you know, speed on, actually, to tell the truth right now. But so we are waiting the uprising from the poor regions, but we have to wait the uprising from the main cities of this country. But on the other hand, we understand these imperialistic ambitions, especially from the people who are well-educated, who have money and who live in the center of Russian Federation, are not going anywhere. So for us Ukrainians, their uprising doesn't make the point of view of the nation as a whole, right? So we need something more than just uprising against uh, that they don't have a chance to travel abroad because of the isolation of Russian Federation or they have uh, the higher price uh, to buy BMWs or whatever. Keep in mind that there is what Ukraine wants and needs, but then there are the actions of the Russians on their, on their own. If the Russians, especially in Moscow and Petersburg, and again, because those are the regions that matter most, if they can't travel and leave the country anymore, and Putin is about to close the borders, if the mobilizations continue, and they will continue because now they're hoping to expand the army to two, three million, then sooner or later, the draft, the call the, the, the call up to, to the army, won't be confined as it has been until now, primarily in the provinces. As you know, it's been the North Caucasus, Buryatia, and places like that that have been have suffered the greatest casualties. Sooner or later, the turn will come for Moscow and Petersburg. And the fact that it hasn't thus far means that Moscow, or the Kremlin rather, understands very well that the response on the part of those populations might be very different from the response in Buryatia or in Omsk or Tomsk. So what they do may or may not promote the Ukrainian cause. They may not intend to weaken the state. They may not intend to help Ukraine. But in effect, they will be weakening the state and they will be helping Ukraine. So the Ukrainian task, it seems to me, is primarily centered on doing what Ukraine has been doing very effectively thus far, imposing enormous casualties on the Russian armed forces, number one, and then of course, number two, liberating, if not all of the territory, at least as much as it can possibly be done. Because that's the key. The war is the key. The longer the war takes, the worse things are for Russia. I think it's a mistake to believe that the war that the longer the war takes the worse it gets for ukraine frankly it's again it's obviously not good for ukraine but it will be much worse for russia because all of these destabilizing forces to which i've already alluded will acquire even greater force as a result of the time so you mean that uh, from all of our question to our Western alliance, uh, why don't they give the weapon to stop it as soon as possible? Now I understand your point of view. So from this point of view, this uh, victory on the battlefield uh, very fast uh, will not stop uh, the war between Ukraine and Russia as a whole. And the second one, the sanctions that can be very draconian for the Russian Federation, but still are not used by Western allies, are working in a long-term period to collapse Russia at the end, right? So this is the strategics that we just don't get right. Well, I don't know if that's the, the Western intent. I think the reluctance to supply Ukraine with the weapons it needs has other reasons, namely, initially, Remember, back in February, even in March, no one believed that Ukraine could possibly put up resistance. The expectation was that in two days it would be over, in two weeks at the very most. In other words, Ukraine was perceived as a loser, Russia was perceived as the winner, and the question that people in the West posed to themselves is why should we provide weapons to the loser who's going to lose anyway? We're just going to drag out the loss and make it bloodier. 
And at the same time, some of these weapons could fall into the hands of the Russians and so on. That began to change significantly when the Russians left Kyiv, Chernihiv, and Sumy Oblast. And it became clear that this juggernaut, this invincible machine, was actually very vulnerable. And by the time Ukraine seized Kharkiv and, of course, captured Kherson, or at least most of Kherson Oblast, it became increasingly clear that Ukraine, first of all, could stop the Russians, and secondly, could drive them out, and thirdly, win. And I think it's only now, again, within the collective West, that this belief that Ukraine can actually win if it has enough weapons, of course, and the right weapon, but Ukraine can actually win. But this belief is only now becoming um, the conventional wisdom. And because it's now the conventional wisdom, supporting Ukraine makes very big sense. It's no longer about supporting a loser, it's supporting a winner. And everybody wants to support a winner. Uh, so I would expect you know, despite the fact that these deliveries of weapons have been slow and inadequate, I do expect them to speed up in the next weeks when General Milley came to Poland to meet General Zaluzhny. This is a remarkable event. An American general who leads the armed forces travels thousands of miles to meet with a Ukrainian general. I mean, the symbolism is simply fantastic. And then, of course, he says that we will support Ukraine and so on and so forth. Rammstein is supposed to take place in a few days. And, of course, the British are already promising tanks, Patriot missiles are being delivered, and so on. I expect that to increase. And, of course, if it does increase, then Ukraine really does have every chance of winning. And in that sense, when the Russians say, we are fighting NATO, they have a point. Uh, but it's not because NATO started this. It's because Russia began a genocidal, as well as stupid, idiotic war against Ukraine. A war that will go down as one of the major strategic blunders of the 21st century. Because, as I said, in response to your first question, that war is likely to serve as the spark for the collapse of the Russian Federation. Yeah, I see. I see your point. But now we are observing a lot of historical moments. Uh, we actually live in the history right now. And uh, maybe we are the one who will write this history down for our kids and our grandkids. But one more thing is uh, very important and who can help in this process because we see a lot of uh, opposition leaders that start to speak out but uh, from the observation of the nearest past, we understand uh, the real opposition leaders uh, at once uh, were killed by Putin. And from what I uh, remember, uh, it's uh, Boris Nemtsov. All the others freely speaking uh, outside the country before 21st of uh, February, they were speaking inside of the country. So who are these uh, opposition leaders? I want to uh, quote the uh, one of uh, Tatarstan government officials in exile. Exile. He said this, uh, the next thing, our struggle for independence has not yet begun. But let's be realistic. They were inside of the country. They had uh, no achievements or visible results in changing the regime inside the countries. So now they're in exile like the others. We have a lot of groups that uh, position themselves like uh, the organization of uh, people who will free uh, Russia from this uh, authoritarian regime. So they were used inside so what can they do outside in the exile do you believe in all this opposition is it opposition well you know the emigre oppositions and of course there were very many in ukrainian history and russian history after world war one after world war two uh, they organize they tend to pre they prevent present themselves as being the future of the country. And most of the time, they have very little to no impact. Uh, however, you know, in the past, emigres have provided opposition elements within Russia, Ukraine, and other places with literature, with information. They've lobbied for the cause of the homeland. 
in Europe, in the United States. So they're not completely irrelevant. They do make a bit of a difference. And again, I, I can say that from the point of view of the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States or Canada, we are not terribly influential, but we can make a difference at particular times and in particular places. So I wouldn't discount the emigres completely. I don't know, you know, if and when the Federation falls apart, many of the emigres will come back. Some of them will want to play an important role in Russian politics, and they conceivably might. Um, I, I'm a little skeptical. I think the local Russians will want to keep things in their own hands. But then you have examples like the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, where emigres came back and occupied important positions in the government. Thomas Ilves was even president of Estonia. He went to Columbia College, as did I. So it's possible. I, again, I don't know if it's very likely in the case of Russia, but it's possible. What I see, however, as the more fundamental point, and again, I'm shifting the focus from intentional opposition to what I call this kind of structural opposition. What I see happening in Russia sooner or later in all likelihood putin will be ousted putin may die putin may be killed one of those three scenarios is very likely in the next year maybe sooner if and when he goes and he will the regime which he constructed which is his regime he's been in power for 23 24 years will be without that core. And the result of that will be very similar to what happened in Russia after Stalin's death and after Lenin's death. There will be a power struggle. Uh, We can already imagine who the the oppositionists, who the contenders will be. Uh, There will be the extreme right, Strelkov, to put it simply. You let's call them the moderate conservative right in the middle who want to somehow or other end the war and bring Russia back to some sense of normalcy. And then there's likely to emerge within this context that quasi-democratic opposition, an opposition which will focus bringing about some greater degree of democracy. I call them quasi-democrats because I'm not persuaded that Russia has true democrats, but for present purposes, that'll suffice. And these are people who could be, they could be Navalny, uh, they could be an emigre. More likely than not, they're going to be someone that we don't know of at this point in time. Perhaps someone who's currently sitting in jail, as happened during Perestroika. All right? Um, And within that context of a power struggle between these three groups, Russia will be weakened. But at the same time, the Democrats or the quasi-Democrats will have a chance, I don't know how big or how strong, but they will have a chance to influence the direction of the country, perhaps form a coalition with the conservatives, perhaps even succeed in winning. Again, at this point, we're in the realm of fantastic speculation because it's, you know, it's obviously impossible to foresee these details. But given the power struggle, the possibility of a let's call him a democratic Khrushchev emerging, is not impossible. Uh, Or at least a semi-democratic Khrushchev is actually quite possible. And we could see a thaw, uh, we could see a significant transformation taking place, even though the people who are introducing these changes aren't Democrats. They may be Democrats who who emerge objectively given the situation that exists. But we're still afraid that the next one will be much worse than Putin. Actually, this option is uh, still actual. Yeah, but we don't know. Uh, But on the other hand, you said about uh, the regime. So from the historian point of view, what kind of regime, in fact, uh, in Russia is right now? Is it fascism, Nazism? Putinism or other phenomenon? Do you have uh, such examples in the world? I mean, uh, on the basis of what events and circumstances uh, uh, this regime could even arise in the civilized, as we thought before, society of Russian Federation? Uh, Because it's quite different from what we saw in 30s and 40s of the uh, previous century in Germany, right? So what is the feminine? Well, yeah. I'm, I, again, I 
I've been writing since 2007. So 15 years ago, I began saying, writing that the Putin regime is quasi-fascist. Not completely, but close. And then in 2016, I finally stated in an article that it's fascist. And so I believe it is indeed a fascist regime. Uh, now, if one looks at the academic literature on fascism, there are thousands of definitions. There is complete disagreement on what fascism is. To my mind, it's I, I reduce it to two or three particular elements. It has to be an authoritarian regime. So in other words, non-democratic. It could be totalitarian, but it has to be at least authoritarian. And it has to have a charismatic leader who constructs the regime around himself. And thus far, they've always been men, but I guess one could have a woman too. And who also constructs a cult of personality around himself. So you have a charismatic leader with a particular cult of personality, a particular kind of image, and an authoritarian system. To me, those are the key features of a fascist regime. And I look at Nazi Germany and I say, yes, authoritarian, cult of the leader, charismatic personality. I look at fascist Italy, authoritarian, mm -hmm. cult of the personality, charismatic leader. All right. I look at Putin's Russia and I conclude the same. Now, as to why, yes, wait, I, you were about to say something. No, 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 I just wanted to add just one very important nuance is that uh, Hitler made something for the country at that period of time. The poor people, they saw the abilities for themselves, I mean, the economy. He started to improve the situation in the economy. So what we see in Russian Federation, each year, worse and worse the situation in the economy. Isn't it so? But the people are still satisfied with this charismatic leader and all these promises that were pouring in their heads uh, from the television. Well, again, some, some fascist regimes do better economically, some do worse. You know, it, it all depends. I mean, in, in this particular case, it has to do with the nature of the Russian economy, which is so heavily dependent on energy. And remember, until a number of years ago, uh, the Russian economy was growing, and Putin was able to say, look, this is my contribution to you. Now, of course, it was growing because the price of oil and gas shot through the roof, so it had very little to do with his own abilities, but nevertheless, he happened to be in the right place at the right time and could claim responsibility for these changes. But as to why this regime emerged in Russia, I here I think the analogy with Nazi Germany is really quite striking. Remember what happens in Germany and in the Soviet Union. They both collapse. Germany collapses in 1918. The Soviet Union collapses in 1991 as a result of systemic crises, a war in one on the one hand, Perestroika on the other hand. As a result of the collapse, the empire is lost. The Democrats come to power in both regimes. The economy is shattered. There is hyperinflation, high unemployment. There is complete cultural confusion. Um, again, it sounds like a very creative period, but at least for most Russians and most Germans, it was a very disturbing period. Society was fighting each other, right? There were all sorts of tensions. And then who gets blamed for the chaos? Well, it's the Democrats in both cases. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to make Yeltsin into a super Democrat, but compared to Putin, he is clearly a Democrat. And it was the same, the same was true in Weimar Germany. And then what happens in this chaos, in this collapsing system, where the Democrats are blamed for the humiliation of the collapse, for the loss of empire, for the hyperinflation, and so on and so forth, suddenly, a leader on a white horse, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, appears and says, I can solve your problems. I can make Germany great again. Mm -hmm. I can make Russia great again. And they appeal to that sense of pride, that sense of humiliation. They appeal to that sense of unjustified weakness. And they do so by projecting an image of themselves which projects strength, youth, 
vitality. You know, you remember those photographs of Putin riding a horse yeah, with a gun. He's bare chested. He was everywhere. And the same, he was everywhere. And of course, Mussolini did the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. There you can, if you do look at the internet, you'll find exact identical photographs of Mussolini. Hitler didn't do that. I mean, he had, he had a different style. But that's the package, and that's the essentially the historical analogy. So Russia is following in Weimar Germany's footsteps, and Putin arguably is following in Hitler's footsteps. Both began wars of conquest, of imperialism. In both instances, they said they were saving their people in their historical lands. And I think in both instances, we can expect catastrophe for Germany, obviously, and for Russia as well. Help us to understand what's wrong or what's going on with the people of Russian Federation in the next context. Those who shot their own Tsar and his children, who demolished churches and um, staged the genocide of their own people, now canonize the same Tsar, elevates the cult of Orthodox uh, Church to fanatism, as we see, and consider genocide uh, as a justified method of uh, state security. And uh, all these foreign agents that are looking uh, inside the country and, and all other elements of all of this. And all this uh, craving for necrophilia, figuratively speaking, people who left at the mummy-like uh, leaders of the late 80s in the Soviet Union, now they they pray to the wall of uh, dead people on the red church. What's going on in their minds? It's the same people, but is this phenomenon? Well, I, I, you raise a very good po good point. I mean, it's something I've thought about and written about as well. Enthusiastic joy with which so many Russians not just view but greet the atrocities being committed in Ukraine. All those telephone calls between soldiers and wives, soldiers and mothers, where they talk about how many women they rape, where they talk about what they've looted, uh, how they've tortured, um, and they talk about this openly. And then the women respond by giggling. Yeah. And they tell them, oh yes, keep it up. The same is true of the response to the atrocity committed in Dnipro just a few days ago. One of the television personalities, uh, Sergei Mardan, I believe his name is, was saying, uh, am I joyful? Yes, I'm joyful. I'm happy that this is taking place. Clearly, there is a brutal, violent, or streak and it's, my guess is it's a very wide streak in Russian political culture. And if you look back historically, we actually see a lot of evidence of that. There is an indifference to human life. It doesn't seem to matter. Yours or mine doesn't seem to matter. Um, and there seems to be a kind of joy, a glee from seeing people suffer. Uh, we have all sorts of accounts under Stalin of the NKVD shooting and executing people with bullets to the back of their heads. And they were doing so gladly, willfully, almost joyfully. Uh, we find other instances of mass atrocities in Russian history, uh, some of which were presumably done un involuntarily, but most seem to have been done and greeted and greeted voluntarily. Uh, again, the conclusion I draw from this is that Russian political culture is very, very sick. Uh, it's a political culture that needs to go to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and have extended therapy to figure out why it is that the Russians are not just indifferent to suffering, but actually gleeful and welcoming of suffering. You know, how does one explain this culture? And one will have to look at the historical evolution of Russia, the, the way in which the empire was built, and of course, it was built largely by means of violence. One has to look at the nature of the Russian Tsarist regime. Uh, one has to look at the role of the Aprichniki or yeah. the Akhrana, the secret police, the NKVD. It's a very complicated procedure. And obviously, part of the investigation would entail looking at Russian culture, at Dostoevsky, Pushkin, Tolstoy, and others, and just, you know, trying to figure out what their attitudes towards atrocities, violence, and so on. So it's a complicated task, but it's a task that, first and foremost, the Russians will have to undertake themselves.
And here again, the I think the analogy with Nazi Germany is quite appropriate because one of the questions that Germans asked during and after the war was how could this happen in a country that was known for its poets and thinkers? in a yes, country yes, that was okay. always at the forefront of the Enlightenment. And part of the answer was because it's a cultural problem, had to do with German culture, Prussian culture, perhaps. And this is where emigres can play a role, because it's hard for Russians in Russia to take stands on these issues without getting arrested. But people like Kasparov, people uh, like Khodlikovsky yeah. and many others, they can begin initiating d- discussions of this. That would be an important start. It would be only the beginning, of course, yeah. and the process would have to last much longer. I still have two more questions uh, to conclude our discussion uh, this time. Everything more to what you say, everything was stalling. I mean, the history in some, uh, let's say, areas, uh, there was stolen culture, there was stolen, I don't know, music, whatever. We can count a lot that was stolen by Russian Federation from Ukraine in this case. So uh, do you think that historical justice is possible after the end of this war? Because from what we see right now, even Pichersky Lavra is ours, get back finally, since uh, hundreds of years. And uh, the myth about uh, fraternal people finally dispelled, these two main options can be solved at the end of the war. Well, you see, there are two components to this. One is Russian attitudes towards Ukraine. And those, if Russia loses the war, whatever that means, those will begin to change. But they will only begin to change. But then there are Ukrainian attitudes towards themselves and towards Russia. And as you know from public opinion surveys, it was always the case in the last 30 years that something like 90% of Ukrainians viewed Russia positively. So despite the Maidan, despite the Orange Revolution, these numbers remained exceedingly high. That's over. That is ended. And it's due to Putin's genocidal invasion. And Ukrainians have begun essentially from below, but also from above. They are ridding their culture of these imperial Russian traces. At, you know, at one level, it's a question of street names, but it's an important question monuments, a new perspective on history. And fundamentally, the most important part is that Ukrainians now no longer view Russia positively. It's no longer 90%. It's more, I think I saw a poll, it was 5 or 10%. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, and in that sense, what Putin has done, he has consolidated the Ukrainian nation. He has enhanced Ukrainian national identity by means of this war. But wars do this. Wars force people to make choices. And the choice before people, before Ukrainians is either accept genocide or fight back. That's really the only choice. And no one is going to accept genocide. So Ukrainians are doing exactly the opposite. They're fighting back. And as you know better than I do, uh, for instance, in the immediate aftermath of the Dnipro bombing, I remember I, re- I recall reading an, a journalistic account interviews with some of the people. And one of them said something that struck me. My hatred is greater than my fear. Yeah. And that says it all. And at the end of uh, our conversation, I want to remember one of the quotes because there are lots of quotes said a thousand years ago by Socrates, Aristotle, Platon, Machiavelli, actually, by the way. Maybe he's a hero of Putin as well. But uh, Otto von Bismarck, a lot of people who were saying the same thing, that human nature is still the same, except for decoration or changing. So what we observe right now, I want to quote uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He said that either humanity will end war or war will end humanity. We're standing on the edge because we have nuclear manipulation by Putin. We're standing at the edge like a humanity. So what will win, you see? What will be after this war? The next war in China and Taiwan and all this circle will repeat and repeat and repeat or not? When it comes to war in general, I'm somewhat of a pessimist. I I think wars will continue. Mm. 
On the other hand, keep in mind that for some 75 years, 50, 50, 75 years after World War II, there were no major wars. I mean, there were wars, of course, and they were major for the people who died, but there were no really big wars. And it's generally argued that the reason for that was because the world was bipolar. It was the United States versus the Soviet Union. There was a balance and no one wanted to disrupt this balance. At the end of what we see now is a tripolar world, Russia, China, the United States, which is actually very destabilizing because you don't have a balance. Mm -hmm. It's always two against one which is why it's extremely important for Russia to lose. When Russia loses, it will be demoted to a middle power. And of course, it may even fall apart. But best case scenario, it will be demoted to a middle power, like France, like Germany, like Brazil. And then the world will consist of two main superpowers, the United States and China. Mm -hmm. And that will actually, that's actually good news for the world, because that will force the Americans and the Chinese to develop some kind of modus vivendi. And we might go back to that period of peace that we, we had for some 50 years in the, in the aftermath of World War II. But Russia has to lose. If Russia wins, whatever that means, that would be a catastrophe for humanity, because it would mean that imperialism, aggression, genocide will go unpunished, can go unpunished, and of course will go unpunished. Like, and then we can expect yeah. China to invade Taiwan and all sorts mm -hmm. of bad things. Yeah. It was very interesting to communicate with you and hopefully we will uh, continue our conversation late, uh, in, the, in the nearest future, a little bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure.